Anyway, it's, it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, to you tonight uh, Mark Lee, who together with Sharon Johnson uh, has, uh, in my opinion, the only really interesting North American office, uh, Johnson Mark Lee. Mm -hmm. um, they started their office in 98. Uh, and Mark uh, graduated both from UCLA and uh, the Harvard GSD program. Um, now, all these simple facts aside, I think we have already for quite a while uh, a parallel life in the sense that we, we met each other, um, I would say, seven, eight years ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. And since then, we happened to meet each other in various occasions because over time, I think we accumulated a lot of friends, but also, I would say, compagnon de route, mm -hmm. so people with whom we feel we share a lot of things, and despite the fact that, I would say sometimes formally, uh, there's discrepancies, uh, we feel that we really share a, a very intense, uh, I would say, opinion about what would be the significance of architecture, and so for that reason it was mm -hmm. fundamental uh, to have Mark here, and mm -hmm. even more fundamental to have him talk about Franco Gary and about himself, because at least, and I think I can share that with you here, I have a, a hidden fascination for Franco Gehry, uh, and not even so hidden perhaps anymore, but, um, and I'm sure uh, Mark and Sharon have it too, um, and I would be very interested in, in that mental construction, mm -hmm. so thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Louder? Yeah. Okay, well, I thank you, Kirsten, for the introduction and the um, the invitation to come and, and, and share uh, some of our thoughts. It's really an unplugged lecture to talk about Frank, Franco Gehry. What, what I've decided to do today is to mainly uh, focus on two projects. Uh, the first one is the, uh, of Frank Gehry's is the, um, the Vitro Museum in Bar and Bryan. And then the second one from our projects is the Vault House that was just completed this year. Um, um, uh, Frank Gehry is based in Los Angeles, and we are based in Los Angeles. And uh, may maybe some of you might think that because we are both from Los Angeles, that there are certain direct influences. Uh, but Los Angeles is a very isolated place. It has a certain ethos of freedom. You know, there are certain things that you, you might be living very close to someone, but actually you are not that close. You can never see them sometimes. Uh, when I was a student of architecture, uh, I wasn't looking at Frank Gehry. I mean, I, I, I basically turned a blind eye towards things that were very close to me, such as Frank Gehry, Morphosis, or Eric Owen Moss. And I found Frank Gehry much later via a very different European perspective. Um, I think like many people of my generation, we're looking to a certain distance, a geographic distance as well as a distance in time. So there was one time I went to see the lecture of uh, Aldo van Eyck. Uh, those of you might know Aldo van Eyck being a, a prominent Team 10 member. Um, he was at that stage in his career uh, where he had gained a reputation of being very angry and very bitter, uh, especially towards the younger generation. So um, I went to his lecture, a two-hour long lecture. First half, he gave a lecture on this uh, house project that he did, a house for single mothers in Amsterdam, spoke beautifully and poetically about their project. And then after that project, he said, well, I want to make a comment on contemporary architecture. Now, just to preface that, he, he was uh, writing texts. He decided not to name the postmodern architects. He would say MG for Michael Graves, AR for Aldo Rossi, PE for Peter Eisen. He refused to uh, address them by name. And he write texts such as uh, things titled uh, "Post Rats and Other Forms of Pest," you know, uh, uh, referring to the postmodernists and the rationalists. Uh, so when he talked about that, that uh, made the commentary on the contemporary generation, he suddenly turned from uh, Dr. Jacko to Mr. Hyde. I'm really angry. A R P E M G, everything that you expected. And then when he finished that rant, he went back and said, well, I'm going to talk about uh, my competition projects. And then he turned to a very beautiful person, uh, spoke poetically about his project. So there was one moment he said, uh, well, he was explaining a site. He said, well, this is a river. This is the cathedral. This is a project by Frank Gehry. This is... And then he stopped. He, he caught himself 
So he, he looks towards the audience and said, well, some of you might notice that uh, I have mentioned Frank Gehry by name. Right? And everyone sat back and thought, okay, here comes the big bomb. And he said, in all earnestness, I did so on purpose because I think Frank Gehry is a very good architect. That's it. He went back to talk about the work. Never explained. Huh? But I, that was an important moment for me. I never, he never explained. He, I never understood why. Later on, I thought maybe uh, Van Eyck and Gary shared their interest in plastic arts. And Van Eyck were friends with Carola Gideon Welker, were friends with a group of artists like Hans Opp, um, and Gary, of course, with Sarah Odenberg and such. Or I thought maybe it was um, Van Eyck has a certain sympathy for primitive villages and such that he had found a certain empathy for Gary's project. But I, I never understood the reason. But because of my admiration um, and interest in Van Eyck, I needed Van Eyck to open the door again for me to understand, to start looking at Frank Gary, which was right uh, next to my front door. Well, before I, I, I talk about Vitra, I want to talk about why I put Vitra and, and have to put Vitra in the context of all his work. Um, the Vitra Museum, um, was done at a time when Frank Gehry was about four, 57, 59 years old. So not a spring chicken, per se. But it was his first project in Europe. And for me, it's also a slight paradigm shift. A paradigm shift from working on isolated, fragmented objects to a new type of uh, continuity, a new type of unity. And a subject matter that myself and my office have been interested in. Oh, by the way, um, the title, the title of my talk, or my improvised talk today, is uh, "In My Father's House Are Many Mansions," and the subtitle of that this talk is uh, "How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Frank Gehry." Um, of course, "In My Father's House Are Many Mansions" is uh, a, a, a Bible verse, uh, a promise from Jesus. Uh, it's also uh, the title of a song by Elvis Presley. But also it was a, a essay that uh, a title of an essay that Peter Eisenman wrote about John Haydock, and and I, I find this whole notion of house as a singular versus many mansions as plural is something that interests me, and and, and furthermore I, I find the uh, the uh, the framework of this whole lecture series fascinating. This whole idea of dif difficult double, I, I think the last for me for my my West End I think the last ten twenty years. The intellectual discussion within architecture or culture at large has so much to do with this Jude Deleuze, this Deleuzean discourse about one versus many, one versus many, that the, the double for me represents something different. The, the double is neither one nor many. You know, and, and, and not necessarily dialectic, but we, we haven't had dialectic thought or discussion many times. Maybe now it's a good time to, to bring back this whole notion of, of dialectic thinking, you know. And uh, the subtitle of the talk, How I Learned to, to Stop Wearing and Love Frank Gehry, you'll see. Um, Frank Gehry uh, started his practice quite late. I mean, worked on for another, a lot of people, large offices. And I would say from 52 to today, had about 60 years of practice. In these 60 years of practice, he had built almost 300 buildings, 300 projects. Now, if you compare to uh, Corbusier, Corbusier had died when he was 78, so he had uh, about 60 years, also 60 years. Both practices, Corbusier and Frank Gehry, had 60 years of practice. Corbusier built 70 buildings, uh, 70 buildings versus almost 300 buildings. I thought it was a very intriguing uh, number just to compare. Of course, Corbusier built 70 buildings, but he also wrote 40 books. He headed three journals and uh, starred in one non-feature length film. But I, I think it's interesting just to compare the production, the quanti quantitative production of an architect. Uh, certainly, Kabuze is not just a building maker. He's also a, a maker of uh, polemics and discussion. Uh. So all these uh, quantity matters. And Frank Gehry, uh, you can say both a lot more. But you, if you wanted to turn the, the discussion into qualitative discussion, you can say maybe for Kabuze, the, the, the least important building <laughs> within his 70 building, you pick the least important one, maybe you can write five books about them. Maybe you can with Frank Gehry. But the interesting thing for me is if you survey the entire career of Frank Gehry, you can pick out the important moments, the, paradigm, the, the, the moments that trigger a certain paradigm shift, 
and then all the buildings in between that are not paradigmatic projects. But he needed those buildings that get to get to the next point. And I, I think understanding his, his projects in the context of his entire herb is important. Um, and maybe one more thing I would like to address um, that this whole lecture series about the whole issue of uh, appropriation and, and creating a historical counterpart. I think we all have our forefathers. I think we all have our uh, uh, giants whose uh, shoulders we stand on. Uh, some are conscious and some are not. But, but I think, the, um, I mean, I, I think about like people that uh, architects who appropriate architects work. I think you uh, recently heard uh, a Terry, uh, a Terry Bow Wow talk about Venturi. Um, you would hear Frida to talk about Caesar pretty soon. Uh, and if you look, compare uh, Venturi and Caesar, you can say Venturi's look at Hawksmoor, Vemba, Gropius, Alto. You know, you can continue the list. Or you can look at Caesar and you can say maybe Caesar looks at Adolf Loos, Corbusier, Mendelssohn. You know, very different group. But I, I think beyond the different groups where both of these architects are appropriate from, I think there's a fundamental difference in terms of attitude, in terms of um, how, the, how they are appropriated. So, for example, I think if you're a student, you don't know the difference between Van Bar and Hawksmoor. You go to visit a, group, a, a Venturi building. I think you can tell that it is important for Venturi that you know who he's taking from, whether you know Hawksmoor or not. I think somehow you can tell and if you look at a Caesar building, I think you don't need to know any of the references, but you could tell that Caesar would do everything to hide where he stole from. You know, so I think there's a two fundamental different attitudes in terms of architectural appropriation. Um, Frank Gehry, for me, Frank Gehry is obvious huh? to show you how he make things, how things are done, but, but not so obvious in uh, showing you how thing, what things mean. And, and I think this type of obviousness, this embracing of the arbitrary, this immediacy about Los Angeles, this whole idea of mobility, or the so-called the lack of context, basically formulates his work. And also formulates his work in relationship to his uh, maybe postmodern colleagues that were working at the same time at, at different contexts and, 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 and uh, areas. So, before uh, looking at uh, Vitra, I wanted to uh, go through some of uh, uh, Gary's projects. The first one is uh, the Danzinger Studio um, in Los Angeles, 1964. Gary was uh, 34 years old, uh, very much in his own account influenced by Louis Kahn, uh, oversized windows, the, the skylight become an architectural element, you know, not unlike the, the volume of the building that it's sitting on. The, the concrete is sprayed on the same methodology. The freeways are constructed. It has a very direct uh, brutalness about the building, um, situated on, on Melrose Avenue for the uh, uh, graphic designer Louis Danzinger, who, according to Gary, quit uh, graphic design and, and became a professional pool player after this building was built. A building that was somehow also memorialized uh, by, by this uh, Dave Hockney drawing of Melrose Avenue with this strong brutalist cube behind. Um, about a couple of years later, uh, Frank Gehry designed this O'Neill Hay Barn in San Juan Capistrano, 1968. It's a hay barn for a friend, almost no budget, $2,000 construction costs. But he basically erected uh, telephone poles and build a pitch roof, a pitch roof that is pitch and not according to the geometry uh, of the plan. So it has a very diagonal pitch. So it's an abstract plane that cuts through, that, that creates this diagonal. So Gary always talked about this project, about this whole idea of tipping and movement that became uh, uh, something that he began to exploit after that. And certainly one of the, the projects that was done was uh, the Ron Davis House in Malibu in 1972 when, when Gary was uh, 42 years old. Uh, uh, it was designed for the artist Ron Davis who did a lot of paintings and drawings that has to do with the notion of perspective and false perspectives. 
Uh, it's really one big shed and with a series of houses and bridges inside. Now, if you look at one of some of Ron Davis' drawings, you can detect some of these notions of bridges that maybe from a symbolic or formal point of view are close to Ron Davis' work. Also, it was cladded in, in corrugated metal, something that is very uh, ate povera, very like you see it in, in, in the streets. Um, um, this bridge uh, that, that bridges an upper, upper studio down to a lower studio. Um, um, this is this is like a almost a Ron Davis uh, motif. Uh, very casual way of, op of of openings. This this major skylight in the middle of the space, exposed joists. Uh, uh, Philip Johnson came to visit and, and claimed that he, who, Philip Johnson, who collected Ron Davis' work, claimed that he didn't understand the work, that that bothered Gary tremendously. Um, but this whole tipping of the roof uh, was later utilized in this uh, shoreline aquatic pavilion in Long Beach, in 1976. 1976, he didn't build this project, but later on he built the. Um, Cabrillo Museum. There was a very interesting typology. Almost, if you look at the plan of this project, it's like a an L shape, but one side is curved. A certain similarity to Carl Odenberg's uh, broken button. Uh, you know, one curved side, this fracture, two two curvature that that comes down based on that fracture. Um, then came 1978. 1978, uh, Frank Gehry, the debut of Frank Gehry's own house. They really put him on the uh, the map uh, culturally, at least. Although he has been practicing for a good almost 30 years, um, uh, time when Frank Gehry was 48 years old. Uh, but before his own house, there were a few projects that he designed around the same time that were not finished, <coughs> they were not built. But I think all these three houses contributed uh, to his own house. Uh, one of the first house is the um, the Wagner House, the Wagner House in Malibu, and this is a house that's situated on a slope. The plan is really a parallelogram, very simple uh, plans, almost a tripartite type of division, and then with these volumes that he had done before, like the skylight or the stairs, architecture elements that are treated as a singular volume that has much integrity of its as as the volume itself. The certain insistence of the, the columns cutting through the window, suggesting a certain um, <coughs> casualness about the window, that the structure continues. So whether the window are uh, parallel to the slope or parallel or perpendicular to the ground, so these type of games begin to to start um, to occur. Also, like this type of drawings, you don't see anymore at the time when Frank Gehry had a close relationship with uh, Bob Irwin. You know the interest, uh, his interest in in constructed uh, isometrics, not not uh, not so far from the time when uh, uh, Peter Eisenman were doing his houses, it, which accumulated in House Ten, with this constructed isometric as a house itself. Um, um, also, I think present were the use of uh, chain link, huh? chain link, uh, uh, not so much uh, as just a basic reference to, to something that is temporary or uh, something that refers to a construction site, but something that also becomes quite ephemeral. Um, besides the Wagner House, another project that he worked on at the same time that did not get built is the Gunther House, uh, in, also in Los Angeles. The use of chain link became what Gary at that time referred to as ghost structure. So on one hand, you have the volumes of the buildings that are very prismatic, very solid, very white. And then on the other hand, you have these ghost structures that are built by chain link. So the solid volumes became the volumes that begin to receive uh, the shadows that were cast by these chain links, which are not hard shadows, but more type of ephemeral shadows. So there's the building and then there's a the ghost structure. So the ghost structure made a much larger presence, a much larger volumes of the buildings themselves. And then um, the, the third volume, the third uh, project that was unbuilt before his house was the uh, Familian House um, for a client that um, was a, a quite an architectural patron. Um, uh, didn't build this house, but eventually uh, commissioned John Lautner to build a, the, the, the Familian House in, in Los Angeles. Um, uh, this is probably one of the first projects that Gary began to not only deal with chain link, but begin to expose the two by four studs, the, the more very typical in 
Los Angeles Construction. Uh, prismatically is really two volumes. It's a it's a bar and it's a it's a cube. Uh, you can begin to see this type of uh, arbitrariness of the windows. You know, however the shape is, the construction continues. Also, the the rotated cube um, was something that he did as a skylight in his own house later. Geometrically, it's very simple. It's a cube and then it's a bar. Um, but also this type of uh, demonstration of construction, how, how one thing is, is held up <coughs> with another, the, the casualness of, of the diagonals that are introduced into the volume. <coughs> and similar to the chain link, there's this contrast between this um, Tadashi Kawamata type of uh, two by four sticks with something very, very uh, strong, uh, as, as some volumes that are very strong. Um, eventually, it accumulated in his house. Um, this is an early photograph. He later on um, uh, renovated the house. It's an existing house. Uh, rather than a, a dialectic uh, uh, situation that was created by his own doing, it was an existing house, and he wrapped around the house uh, the corrugated metal of the Davis house, the chain link that was in the Gunther and, and uh, Wagner house came back. Um, I think it's interesting just to like see the stairs. And the stairs is really a series of cascades, and, and, and the idea of putting concrete in the bottom, and the concrete that belongs to the ground, and then the stair that actually belongs to part of the house or the door. Um, in the entire house, it's really um, exposed plywood. Uh, some of the studs of the old house, some of the sheathing of the old house is exposed. Um, um, the combination of his own <coughs> cardboard furniture with very uh, grungy furniture that you can buy in department stores, uh, relics of the molding of the existing house. It's, it's, it's very much a, a type of um, a, a bricolage. And here we see the, the, the rotated cube that was in the familiar house that's in this house again. Um, a combination of, of exposed uh, um, two by four or, or plywood or a wood construction and then certain things are quite surreal, like putting glass over the wood. So in a way, the glass and the wood, they don't <laughs> deny each other. But you see the glass and then you see the wood construction. So as if it's still under being constructed. At the same time, putting a, uh, putting a, a chain link fence around. Uh, Gary's work, I think, I think Gary is always, for me, very good at knowing where to insert design energy and then leaving life be. You know, in this case, really, the architecture of this space is really all in the, in the ceiling. Uh, opening up an expected view, ex expression of the, um, the, the, the construction. And then below, everything is very simple, very undesigned, very casual type of furniture that exists. Um, this is the same space looking backwards. Um, you see the existing house on the right-hand side and the new construction around. Um, I, I also think, like, for me, this shot is, like, for me, it's a brilliance of Gary, uh, uh, a very uh, designed window uh, with this uh, wide glass, one plane ex slightly extending beyond the post, post is sitting behind the glass, you see the, you see the trees, the slight fin of the extension, you see a strange reflection. Huh? Of, of, the, of the trees. Right next to it, he puts a very standard window. Just anything you can buy from the shop. Doesn't matter how it's finished, the size of it. And as a mediator between the top, he put this uh, uh, Ellsworth Kelly print. So, so for me, this and this and, and how this, <coughs> the shaping, I think this for me was really uh, what makes scary huh, for me. Uh, and later on, unfortunately, this corner was uh, when he renovated the house, the um, horizontal window became a vertical glass window door, and then he put a John Mc McCracken plank next to it, which is brilliant too, but I think the, the Kelly worked much better. Um, yeah, a, a close-up shot of the, uh, the detail that we talked about. Um, I mean, it's also, a, in a way, a statement uh, for, for Frank Gary at, uh, close to midlife uh, of his uh, having worked with corporate clients for a very long time working on the Santa Monica Walt Mall and it was the first time that he was he came on world stage uh, looking at the drawings I think at the drawings they were done 
really for the submission to the city. I think he's really an architect who designed with the model huh, and three-dimensional spaces. Sometimes you see certain uh, maybe relational aspects um, of the new intervention in the existing buildings. But at the end, it's it's much more casual. It wasn't like an Eisen, like an Peter Eisenman type of architect where the the reading of the lines are important. I mean, the, the parallel of the cube and the existing house. Maybe you can see once in a while, but it's it's not dogmatic that way. Um, after the house, uh, Frank Gehry did a series of other projects that uh, maybe some of the experiments that was done in the house became more isolated, such as the Indiana houses, where um, you see these exaggerated windows. Huh? Exaggerated windows where you look at the model, you think they're much smaller houses. And until you're there, you see it in context with the other houses, and you realize that this this uh, uh, window is probably five, six times of, of a typical window around the house. So, so from a distance, these buildings have a, a caricature, a cartoon quality about them. And then when you get closer, suddenly you realize like the scale is very different. The scale is much bigger than than they promise. It's a, it's a very strange relationship of what it promises to be and what it actually is. You know, so both a type of uh, cuteness about them, but also a certain type of monumentality in the presence. Um, also, uh, uh, besides the windows, the, 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 his use for domestic elements such as the fireplace or the representation of a fireplace, the, the bay window, the stair became a uh, way he eroded the corner of these um, three uh, 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 townhouses um, or the stairs. So, in the interior, basically, it became one thing that erased another. So, so I think it's uh, interesting to see how Gary uh, put forms together. So he wasn't so uh, interested in where the forms are coming from, um, or what they mean, or what they represent, but, but how they come together. Uh, sometimes you see one form come together with another, and they erase each other. Sometimes, I don't know if the, uh, Jan's lecture on Eric Moss he would put one form next to an in, in, inside another, and one form stays present and the other disappears. So it's interesting to see how, if you can study how, how Gary interlocks spaces with the volumes together. In this case, clearly, it was an erasure. Whereas on the outside, you can distinct, distinctively tell the differences between the elements, interiorizes completely erase. Um, the uh, Loyola uh, Law School that was built between 1981 to 1984 um, is really situated in a very rough neighborhood. St. Gary decided to introvert the campus, really have a, have a big building, and in front of the big building has a series of smaller buildings, uh, maybe a slight reference to classicism. So there will be a very dumb brick building behind, and he'll put these columns. But, but what was really great is uh, for me is how he animated this this uh, slab building with a series of stairs. They are very scenographic. Huh? Uh, so it's uh, it comes in, comes out. Almost this architectural promenade, and then two more of these stairs that come out, but are uh, exposed. Uh, the structure of it, which is exposed, and and by way con by concentrating on this corner, the the, the windows that were done were quite uh, um, inexpensive. So, but in, in a way, it, it begins to ingratiate the whole building. I mean, I also notice like things like this, like Gary would would not follow the um, uh, the, the railing, the, the internal configuration of the stairs based on what is required with a landing. But in the scale of the building, that need, this needs to be one element, and then it turns into one element. Um, I think similar to uh, this is the other stair that I was talking about on on two sides, and then this is one of the examples of one of the classroom buildings. I mean, this one really is nothing but uh, a volume that brings certain skylight in to the space, to a foyer space that doesn't really meet the height. But I think Gary needs the height for that building to have a certain presence within the campus. I think, I think if you look at the chapel in the middle, the construction of his, high, of his house of having a exposed construct, timber construction and then putting glass for this campanile. Uh, is once again is evident, as well as on the facade of the chapel itself. Um, well, the, the complete uh, ambivalence uh, of this life 
of this clear starry light and then the construction members continuing around. This is a view from the outside for, uh, of this more uh, dangerous neighborhood at that time, so all the buildings are much more introverted. I think, I think this type of um, still life mentality, of thinking of paintings as a, or architecture as a still life painting. I, Gary often talked about Giorgio Morandi. How do you place bottles together and, and, the, and the crevice between, between the bottles? I think sometimes these still lights become more sculptural, in this case, where all the buildings are independent. And then there are moments when the volumes become much more together. In this case, the Aerospace Museum built for the 1984 Olympics, where three, three larger volumes begin to come together. And then secondary volumes are added on, almost in a nonchalant way, for the skylights. Um, one of the buildings that is quite representational is the Shire Day office in Venice from 1984 to 1991. The, um, Frank Gehry designed, uh, Klaus Odenberg designed the binoculars, and then Frank Gehry did the two buildings. It's really, uh, in a way, a facade building. Uh, there are three objects, and then behind the building, there's an L-shaped building that's quite nondescript. I thought it was quite brilliant how, well, first of all, I thought uh, strategically, I think Gehry was smart to bring Odenberg into this project in such a prominent way. In his interviews, he always said, well, if Time Magazine for, uh, uh, features this building, the binoculars will be in the front and no one will remember my buildings. But I think by bringing Frank Gehry, uh, by bringing Odenberg into the project, Frank Gehry has more budget to work on this one and this one. I, I think there's something that uh, I think needs to be said. I think Frank Gehry were very, realized the difference between the value between buildings and the value between art. He talked a lot about noticing the uh, Robert Rauschenberg both making paintings out of dirt, and people would spend a lot more money trying to preserve those paintings rather than they want the money that was spent to on making the paintings. I think there's a certain recognition, uh, Gary being with his art in this art world and with the artist friend, that the cultural value or the translation from the cultural value to monetary value is exponentially different in the art world as opposed to the architecture world, whereas the real estate value of something that's very, it's large, and then the cultural value of an architect that could bring in whether one, whether one won certain awards or has certain cultural cachet at a small amount within this whole spectrum of real estate value. But art is exponentially different. So once it's elevated to the level of art, I think much more money would come in to preserve the building. So I think this, for me, this interest of, of art world value versus real estate value was something that uh, Gary early on had a full grasp on. Uh, uh, at the end, not much was spent on these. I mean, uh, on, on the uh, left-hand side, you see a building with a almost Italian rationalist type of facade, very simple profile, slightly curved. On the right-hand side, we're much closer to what he found with this type of uh, two-by-four stick construction. But then it's really cladded in copper with a complete uh, uh, um, irreverence for the scale of which. Uh, I think this type of uh, still life mentality, placing one object next to another, uh, showing that it works, I mean, also quite uh, uh, intense, uh, uh, Gary turning Odenberg's binoculars into something almost like a classical portico, uh, where the car <laughs> drives underneath, uh, uh, shows that Gary can work with representation, huh? as well as uh, with abstraction. Well, I think we see the same strategy for um, this uh, uh, disco or club restaurant in Kobe, where um, he abstracted the snake as a spiral um, uh, together with a fish and together with another building uh, that started this whole discussion about fish. Uh, uh, but, but you can see, I think one thing that he learned from Los Angeles was also building at places with no context, or how these, this type of context that are quite uh, informal or quite uh, ad hoc became the energy for his work. Um, he later on continued to do, begin to like working on these art pavilions, the whole notion of the snake and the fish. The fish became a way for him to study cladding, uh, surfaces of buildings. Um, but, but this whole notion of, of singularity is, is one thing that, that interests 
um, myself in, in my office. I, I think this early on, this autonomy of these singular objects. Uh, uh, Frank Gehry, this is a house of a filmmaker that was half built. Gary was fired. Someone else came in to connect all the buildings. But the uh, uh, initial notion were these individual houses, uh, not like, uh, unlike um, um, uh, the Moriyama house of. Um, of um, Nishizawa. Nishizawa. I just saw it was in his building. So, so separated objects uh, that are completely has no way of uh, uh, no desire of reconciliation. I, I think to study a series of, uh, uh, of processes of one of the projects, where Gary's plan for the Winton uh, guest house in Minneapolis, 1983. It was a, it was a guest house that was independent. Uh, but on the same property as a project by Philip Johnson. Uh, this is one of the early projects, uh, similar to what he did for this tract house project, a series of volumes coming together almost within a, a cruciform grid. Um, a later version, you begin to see the cruciform grid begins to loosen up. There's a central volume that is there. All the projects begins to hinge um, and eventually came to the, the final project, which is really uh, one central volume that is almost a, 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 a chimney-shaped roof with three separate uh, bedrooms, one of the bedrooms being longer with, uh, with a garage, and then a, a skylight as a volume, as well as the uh, uh, almost a fireplace as a volume. Uh, uh, Gary turns architecture elements like stairs, fireplaces, skylights with uh, equal dimensions as, as the rooms themselves. Um, uh, also, the projects, these are volumes that are just barely hinging, uh, similar to maybe Lee Khan's um, uh, monastery project uh, with a volume or uh, James Sterling's uh, Wiesenschaftszentrum in, in uh, Berlin uh, with a large bar or a large U-shaped building and a series of objects that are semi-autonomous. Uh, this one, they just barely, barely hinge so, so you can always enter from one room to another. Uh, there's a certain power in, in, in this project at this stage, uh, still relatively abstract. Uh, wh when it was built, um, the attribution of different materials to, to different volumes, actually for me, uh, uh, took away some of the strength of, of the project when it, is, it existed in, in model form. Uh, also, the, the certain obligation of uh, uh, bringing in um, architectural scaled elements like like the windows or like the doors, I, I took away a bit of this immediacy and the strength for me of, of that model stage. Nevertheless, there, there, there are moments, uh, there, there are moments that, that are interesting. But when it came to uh, putting in a door that is very normal in contrast with this, some of, some of the, the strength of the, the model could be lost. And then it somehow recuperated again in, in moments of the interior, where the, the differences of the exterior cladding gives way to a much more unified interior. And then when it's more unified, you can begin to see the tension between the shape of the windows in relationship to the shape of the roof. So this was um, uh, finished in 1983. So I think this, for me, brings to um, the, the Vitra Design Museum. Um, uh, Frank Gehry's uh, first project in Europe uh, around the same time or right afterwards, he did the project in Prague, the so-called Romeo, uh, Fred and Ginger project in the center of Prague along the river. He did the American Center in Paris and uh, subsequently other European projects. Now there's, uh, he did the uh, Vitra Center uh, in, in Basel as well as the recent uh, Novartis in Basel. But this was, this was the first one. Um, as you all might know the project very well, it is a, uh, the Vitro campus. There were two buildings by Nicholas Grimshaw. Um, Frank Gehry were commissioned to build the Vitro Design Museum to, uh, uh, at that time, to showcase the, the, the private collection of furniture. Uh, there's a gatehouse that Frank Gehry did, also a warehouse. So these are the two warehouses by Grimshaw. I think not long after, there was the uh, Zaha Hadid's uh, fire station, the uh, Tadao Ando's uh, sort of meeting room or meeting center. Um, and then Herzog de Moron's Vitra house that was finished not long ago. And then the uh, Sana's um, um, 
another warehouse that was, I think, the most recent addition, together with smaller episodes. There's a piano building, there's a Buckminster uh, a dome, um, just the Morrison bus stops and and such. Um, the the uh, uh, the first project that was there was uh, not the first project, but uh, Frank Gehry's getting the commission was through um, a meeting, a chance meeting with uh, Klaus Odenberg and Kosher van Bruggen, who were commissioned to build this balancing two sculpture um, uh, in, in, on the property. And here you see uh, Odenberg and van Bruggen uh, uh, posing for a portrait uh, taken by Ray Eames. Um, and Frank Gehry came, uh, the story goes that Frank Gehry came for the installation, uh, met the client, and uh, eventually were commissioned to uh, design a, a museum and a new factory. Uh, in Frank Gehry's own account, he, he suggested that this was uh, uh, not enough to bring him to, the, to, to travel as a, uh, to LA, to the state, to, to Switzerland, or to Germany. And so somehow he needed two projects, a much more, uh, as a matter of fact, type of factory. But he began to apply his type of sculptural ways that he handled the museum with the circulation. So in a way, the museum together with the gatehouse, together with the, the stairways and, and such of the, of the factory, began to form this uh, mise-en-scene for the entry of the uh, Vitra campus. Um, uh, it, it, interesting, it interests me for this project because Whereas Frank Gehry started off with these singular volumes and then begin to form these fragmented volumes, begin to form villages, and begin to distinguish all these different volumes when they're in an ensemble. This for me is a project where there's a new type of uniformity again in, in, in view of his, the trajectory of his work. And volumes are coming in, volumes are entangled in a much more deliberate way and intersect and then it's all unified. It's not only unified by, by this whiteness, but also the exterior cladding of this, of this project, which is stucco and sink, uh, ta sink uh, panel roofing. Uh, Gary basically decided that every, every uh, surface that is leaned outwards that would be weathered and would receive rain would be, have sink, and every, every surface that are straight or lean inwards would be stucco. So it's almost like an external rule that came in, right, as opposed to the rule of composition, of articulating each of the, uh, each of the objects. So it's almost like a shroud of, of uh, attributing a materiality into the project that forms a new, new sense of unity. Um, it, I think the site, it's, this is uh, when it's under construction, um, the site itself used to be uh, farmland. You can still see these vineyards from a distance. But with industry moving in, I think the context is also changing. And I think Gary also recognized that this sort of lack of, lack of context or the, what he would do would actually determine the future context. I, I think plan-wise, you know, we also, uh, uh, the, the volume, volumetrically speaking, I think one could also detect a lot of things that Gary has done before. Uh, such as the, the strategy for this large uh, uh, entry canopy, which is depicted as a volume with a truss that cantilevers out. Um, it's not a, a very clear figure ground project. Huh? You can say the Loyola Law School is a very clear figure ground. The, the volume, the long slab is the ground, and then the volume in front are the figures. Or a comparison would be Corbusier's um, uh, the Paris the Salvation Army, yeah. Yeah, the city of refuge, you know, a slab and then objects. Huh? Um, this one is not that clear. You know, you look at the plan, it's tripartite. Sometimes the so-called the ground is figured, but not always figured in the same way. The, the larger volume is as a pitch roof, but then the volume that is lower has a slope roof. So when you walk in, this is actually an architecture element, but the architecture element of the stair is treated with the same curvature so that it basically forms a certain symmetrical relationship that, that this happens. So, so it's, it's, um, if you walk around the building, you can begin to see. Um, this is uh, the opposite view. This is the stairwell behind this uh, ramp that you're walking in and eventually ended up in a larger gallery with this barrel vault shaped roof and then two volumes that brings uh, natural light into the space. One volume that brings natural light all the way down to the lower uh, lower gallery, and then one upper volume that brings light only into the upper gallery. A stair that brings you down 
this bump is something that uh, bothers Gary a lot. He later on, this was before Cartier, so uh, when he worked on Bilbao, he had different software to work out the complex surfaces. He was still using descriptive geometry when he did the, did the construction drawing, so he, he said that, that bump on the stair is something that, that bothered him. Um, here you can see the floor plans. Um, um, this is, this is the, the shot that we saw before, the stair going up, the slope roof coming down. He descend a few steps through, through a ramp, go into the gallery, and descend to this gallery. This is the corner that light comes in. You can walk up this stair ramp on the outside, which is an object, and stop precariously here, the stair, uh, the elevator, and then the spiral stair. So all these different uh, architectural elements. So you come up to the second floor. This is the cruciform skylight that is situated right between two rooms. So in a way that this skylight brings light into the double height gallery that's here and also illuminate the upper floor of the upper, upper gallery on this corner. So these are the type of uh, um, erasures in the corner. Uh, here you see some views of how the building itself worked with the distant view of the um, staircases for the warehouses. So at, at certain moments, they are somehow fused together. You don't really see the distinction between the, the foreground and the background. Um, an opposite view, uh, you can see the Grimshaw, you can see the other cluster of circulation elements. And then the, the gatehouse and then the, the back side of this. By the way, I always like think uh, Frank Gehry uh, is very good at doing back side of buildings. I, um, some Japanese friends said, uh, if you go to a sushi bar, you, they, the old way is to order tamago sushi first, like egg sushi. And if the egg sushi is not good, they'll leave the restaurant. So although it has nothing to do with fish, huh? but, the, but the test of an architect, is, uh, of a chef, a sushi chef, is if they can make a good tamago. If you can make a good tamago, you can cut taro. I thought it was uh, absurd, but it fascinates me. And I'm always interested in backside of buildings. Huh? And, in the States, you know, you can look at uh, Morphosis, you can look at Eric Moss, they, you can look at the, the money shot where, they, where the building is photographed the most, so you can always appreciate that. But I, I like to look at the backside, huh? the, the, the places that are not uh, that photographed. Huh? And you really, I think for me, you can really tell the quality of an architect. Uh, for me, that's the tamango of a, of a building. Huh? I think, like, I think Gary does it very well. Robert Venturi does it also very well for me. Um, it's almost like the places with this undesigned energy. Where, how does he organize windows? Um, anyway, th this is the interior of the vaulted room. Uh, a beam that cuts through half of the cruciform skylight and then begins to completely uh, dematerialize the space. It forms into like one, one space. So one skylight has direct light coming in. And um, here are the shots of the, the cruciform skylight connecting to the lower gallery. This is, I think, the initial conception of the space when it was still a, a chair collection. Um, some study drawings of this, not unlike uh, his, the cube in his house, but a, a cruciform. And um, different views of this uh, skylight. Huh? A cross section with a two double height uh, gallery space with the two floors of gallery, the an oversized cruciform skylight that comes down. The in the transverse direction is the second one. You see how that penetrates the um, the barrel vault ground space, which is in this volume, and then a cross section back again in the in the opposite direction. This is a very strange area that you never see. Um, the, the double height gallery, the stair that's going up, a skylight that's coming into the room where the ramp is. But uh, you can imagine like things that happen there, not just water. And then the overview, or huh? oh, this type of casualness of when, when, when this volume, is, this cruciform volume is cut through between two rooms, you can very easily accept mistakes, or maybe not mistakes, of contamination, like the beam continuing, cutting through the cruciform, where in the double height space, the beam would discontinue. You know, so, so I think Gary is 
good at anticipating the, the perils or the, the mistakes in construction, that he sometimes planned certain mistakes in so that other mistakes could come in. But he, when, when, when the initial form or space is strong enough, he could as absorb these mistakes. And sometimes so-called the mistakes would actually give more value to the space itself or to his architecture. The elevation here, you see all the, the difference between the sink and the, uh, the stucco. And then these are the, the different moments, not just of the museum itself, but of the um, ancillary circulation that was near, uh, that was attached to the um, factory. I don't know what this shot is about. <laughs> it looks good with all the furniture. Um, and then back to the raison d'etre of the whole building, and then the current campus today. Um, there was one moment where uh, Frank Gehry was, um, I think before the Vitra House, he was uh, working on adding to the museum, uh, a, a, building, a project that was uh, short-lived, but it was interesting to see this black stuff that he was doing that connects the factory to the museum, adding another volume, and then doing something here next to the entry that's closer to this language versus the, uh, the black stuff that was uh, being uh, um, brought to the foreground. I think after this project, there were a series of other projects that was brought in. Uh, um, the, the Toledo Art Museum, uh, Visual Arts Center, um, the uh, Wiseman um, Museum in Minneapolis uh, used different degrees, different types of stainless steel, um, uh, begins to clamp the entire building, uh, the, the famous uh, Guggenheim in Bilbao, and similar to Minneapolis before, also situated in front of a river. The construction was very different with the introduction of Cartier. Um, Disney Concert Hall that was planned actually in the 70s, but uh, not in the 70s, in the 80s, but not finished until the 2003, and perhaps the more um, recent uh, Novartis building in Basel. So uh, uh, now I think I'd like to show some of um, our work and also a bit in context, uh, the way that we appreciate Frank Gehry. Uh, for Vitra, not, not, not so much uh, just Vitra as a building itself, which we admire, but also in the lineage of where the building was in his career. And from this singularity to this multiple, to this new singularity again, or just on the verge of a new singularity. Um, uh, I, think, I think being in LA, I think being in LA, uh, we share certain, Gary and other architects, we, we share a certain amount of ethos huh, about this this type of, on one hand, this type of individualism, but also a certain um, uh, empathy for the banal, huh? for, for something that's very status quo, huh? whether it be the infrastructures of the city, or in this case, like Kathy Opie's work, <coughs> and of the, of his shot, her shots of the freeway, or to Ed Roucher's shot uh, of, of the paintings of the Standard Station and such. I, I think, as, as uh, like many architects in, in LA, we started off doing single objects, you know, single family houses, you know, from the uh, generation of Moitra, Schindler, to the, uh, the generation of Moth and Morphosis, to Gary. Uh, and not until recent years were the public architecture uh, of the, of in the city, where had, people started to pay certain attention to it. Uh, for the longest time, the high rises in downtown LA were third, third rate high rises, maybe not until uh, 25 years ago when Isosaki came and did the Mocha, and eventually Moneo came and did the cathedral, Disney Concert Hall, and such, that there was actually a cultural corridor with um, so called architectural work. But most of, most of one's commissions are, are single family houses. And I, I think this whole uh, notion of the object is something that, that for us is very um, indigenous of LA. Right? Rena Van Ham wrote about the four ecologies of Los Angeles. Uh, uh, geographically speaking, many of them are still very much true. The, the social political dimension has changed over the years, uh, the last 40 years. Uh, but, but very much, I think, the ecology of objects, so Los Angeles being a city of that is, could be described as the ecology of objects is still very much present. Um, so, so I think over the years, whether we um, 
built in in the states or built in LA or built outside of LA or rebuilt in different countries. I, I think there's a certain Los Angelesness that um, that I think we we carry with ourselves. And and maybe at the end, uh, LA is less about the physicality of the city than than a, than a state of mind um, that we see. Um, and, and at the same time, we feel very much. We took a lot from the city, although we at the same time feel quite distant huh, from uh, the so-called uh, uh, LA architects. Um, and I, I think the, there's a, a progression from dealing with single objects to multiple objects, when, when objects begin to double or begin to pro proliferate into larger aggregation, to our, our more current projects that actually deal with mid-sized projects that requires for us a, that a, a new singularity to bond all these things together. When the, the mid pure act of aggregation doesn't, doesn't, uh, uh, is not as efficient as before. Uh, this doubleness is something that we have looked at in other projects. This was the one in Chile. Uh, we took the same uh, concept of a formula to do one in Shanghai with, with six of these uh, half ellipses, um, three looking in, three looking out. Um, this was a competition for a project that Kirsten was involved in not far from here in Lake Geneva. Um, the negative objects that are interlocked into one another but still maintains its own autonomy. Um, um, uh, the a house in, in uh, oh, Kirsten was also involved in this one. That's why right. we always, uh, this is in uh, Maturana between uh, Valencia and, uh, and Barcelona uh, and, and the one in uh, Mo Mongolia and Ordos. Um, this is a series of projects that we did when in uh, Gota Frata, where we begin to look at the aggregation of different ways of aggregating different objects. And in this case, it's a museum with five volumes, but one unified roof that that a, a negative shape that cuts through the roof so that all the volumes uh, have different ceiling heights. So I think this is the one thing that we, we learned from Bangeri. There's a certain um, freedom in plan, and then there's a certain uh, notion in section. And then the operation in section could be completely different <laughs> from the, or uh, completely free from the, the, the operation in plan. Um, for another building, we, we begin to stack these volumes. Some of them are left. Um, quite standard as part of the module, and some of them, the roof are lofted and form these negative spaces. Um, I think like looking at uh, uh, Gary's house, you know, the placement of very designed windows are very standardized openings. And for us, it's not just a, a result of circumstance, but I, we, we begin to look at the, the spatial potential of some of these projects. Um, the stacked housing that was right next door to it. Um, these are the, the more uh, uh, project scale of the projects that we're working on. This is a school um, for UCLA School of Fine Arts where there's an existing building in the corner and we begin to duplicate the, the roofing structure and we also duplicate the existing facade. So to generate something that is very uh, 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 standardized or almost like anonymous and then the, the, uh, the spatial surprise actually happens in the interior. This, 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 sometimes we do uh, collages like this. This is our secret ambition that it would be so banal that Ed Rocher would, would paint it one day and put it next to his standard stations. Um, uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, LA is not a place of, um, of uh, hardcore like, detail of construction. It's pretty far away from it. And, and I think for us, we, we learn how to not design certain elements and focus on elements that are um, maybe five percent of the project, where we insert certain amount of architectural design or energy. Like, I mean, this I think this is something that that we thought Gary did really well in, throughout his career. But maybe for us, different from uh, architects like Morphosis, is that the the area that you spend a disproportionate amount of design energy and construction costs are the ones that you uh, feel the least. You know, like I mean, this is a very standard uh, uh, house. But for us just to move the opening a little bit over, to stagger the construction or push the window over, the rest of the house we, we built it out of as cheap a, a stucco as we could. Um, or the house uh, on a hill that was, has a substandard lot, uh, by minimizing the, the, the footprint and minimizing the construction costs of the caissons that go into ground, we were able to maximize the volume, but also create a certain tension between the desire for a maximum volume and a minimum footprint on a uh, unstable, uh, unstable hillside. Um, 
uh, those who, who know uh, Rainer Benham's book on Los Angeles know about the, the four ecologies that he talked about, the, the foothills, uh, which we had the opportunity to work on quite a bit. Also, the, the plains of Id, in this case, a house in Argentina, a very flat uh, pampas, but a very suburbanite type of development. Uh, a very singular object, but we know that in the future there will be other objects around. Or um, a house that was just uh, finished um, up in the uh, Palisades, where it's situated on a very uh, 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 end of a valley with a, the natural curve on the side. That we, we, we begin to look into the um, uh, the typology of the uh, double porch house in, in American houses, American construction. Um, uh, so for us, there's also some, some tension between the, this very gentle curvature, the response to the site, and a very flat uh, a glass volume that could slide open. Um, this is the project in Shanghai that basically came from the Chilean project. So there, there are three volumes that are introverted and three volumes that are extroverted and framing different views. Um, um, so I, mean, I think this is one of the projects where we, we thought we really reach a certain uh, uh, limitation in terms of where this aggregation could go. If the project becomes bigger, we begin to say, well, can we continue to add? Uh, does it still form a whole? Huh? And, and uh, I don't know if it does, but I, I think like if you look at pieces of sushi, and then if you get enough pieces of sushi, you begin to see a fish. Huh? And then uh, if there are enough fishes, and then you begin to see a school of fish. So, so there are certain moments where you, you can't just have sushi. Right? You, have to, you begin to see a fish. I'm a little hungry. I'm having sushi tonight. Um, I, I think also this distinction between the, the, the aggregation quality of the exterior versus a much more open and abstract interior is, has been something that's prevalent in our work. So I'm going to go straight to um, this is another project that we're working on. It's in a, a drawing center in Manila. I think similar to the uh, um, uh, UCLA project, the, the roof is a, becoming a new element for us, that we think that a series of village is unified by this singular roof. It's, it's because the, the, this, it's a, a, a works on paper. It's very delicate. So it needs a lot of uh, darkness uh, in the room. So a lot of the building is for us is about stretching the building as far out as possible. Not unlike the early uh, Frank Gehry projects where he stretches the, the mass of the building with, with these uh, ghost structures. There's no, no, no money, budget to build this, He's, but there's a certain desire to. So by stretching the building out and making it bigger than it appears to, we create a lot of spaces that belongs to both the park and, and the building itself. So one always enters into these spaces that are semi-deformed, by, defined by architecture, and uh, in concert with the existing landscape. Um, and we always enter into one of these courtyards or these porch areas. The, the light level becomes much dimmer before you slowly enter into a lobby space and eventually walk into the gallery. So you don't have this man-made effect from walking from a very bright space into a very dark space. So whether you come from the west, from the western courtyard to the eastern courtyard, you end up in this um, uh, almost like a program, this room, that, but it's a very definitive room like these uh, shaker houses where there's a non-programmed space, but then it can be used for every, uh, gathering presentations or uh, curatorial purposes. But uh, in this space, you're always aware of these outdoor rooms, such as in, you see the eastern courtyard again. To your left, you see the scholar courtyard that is not um, public, but only for scholars and curators. But the, the private and public spaces are always united together. So on one hand, you have this singularity of these type of spaces that are formed by the roof. But on the other hand, the roof becomes something that is uh, continues that unify the different negative spaces or the interstitial spaces that happens in the lobby as well as in the volumes underneath. So which um, brings me to the project that I would show a little bit more, uh, which is the, um, the vault house that was designed uh, in 19, uh, not 19, 2007. Um, but uh, uh, during the economic crisis, the project was stalled and then it was picked up later again, and it was just finished this year. Um, it, it is situated right on the beach. It's right on. It's in the beach of Oxnard. It's between uh, Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, about a one-hour drive north of Santa Monica. 
Um, I mentioned earlier about the four ecologies. You know, I think this is this uh, suburbia is a very typical uh, ecology in, in Los Angeles. Uh, not only in Oxnard, but down to Malibu, to the South Bay. The typical lots are very narrow and very long. Um, uh, they're packed like like sardines. And, and typically, what people do is they would put the uh, the master uh, bedroom above and then the living room below. Um, so it's great for those rooms, but then the rest of the house is get, it becomes very dark. Um, furthermore, you oftentimes you have to walk uh, in these uh, unceremonious uh, alley-like spaces and then turn in a very awkward way to enter the house where the, the parking is up on the street. So when we uh, work on our project, uh, I think at the outset what we wanted to do is to bring as much light into the darkest part of the house, in this case, to bring a courtyard. So you walk into the courtyard first, and the courtyard not only brings light into the rooms around it, but also opens up the space before you enter into the house in a, in a proper way. Um, the second thing we wanted to do is to bring the view as uh, deep into the house as possible, the view and the air as deep into the house as possible. And you might also notice that here is the way where the, the zoning changes. So lucky for us, we could also have this corner that looks out in this direction. Whereas in a more typical situation, all you look out is in this direction. Right next to us, there's no house yet. It's an empty lot. But we know that in the future, there will be another house. So when we planned this project, we were preemptively thinking about what will happen next door. Um, we, we tried many solutions, and none, none worked um, that well until we came to this one, which is we decided to give every room a shape, in this case, a barrel vault shape. And they are all uh, directed towards the view and the, and, the, and the street. And they are packed together like sardines into the ma uh, maximum buildable volume. So um, this is a conceptual diagram of the house, a conceptual model. The, the, um, the, uh, the barrel vault rooms are never intersected with one another. So they're always autonomous, and, and, and they're always open on both sides. So um, these are some early sections where if you cut a series of transverse sections, uh, you will see a double height space, you will see a, a courtyard, you will see these independent rooms. And, um, and, and uh, our thought is to see how we, deep we can bring the view into the house. Uh, it's, well, hopefully we can bring it like two-thirds or three-quarters into the house that you always, even to a point where you don't really see the water, you don't see the sand, you sense this connection uh, that we see in a lot of uh, uh, shotgun-type houses when you have this type of enfilade, one room after another. Um, plan is very simple. This is, the, this is the ground floor because it's a tsunami zone. The project has to be raised. This is the garage. So you walk here, and you walk up a few steps into this courtyard. And then you enter the house, and there's a dining um, kitchen. And then this is a double height living room spaces. An alternative way is to walk up the stairs up to the master bedroom, uh, master bath. And this shadows between the courtyard and this double height living room space. Um, or <coughs> another way is to walk down to the garage, or walk, take a few steps up into this uh, library office area, and then there you have two uh, guest bedrooms uh, facing the street. Um, and then you can also, from the master bedroom, you can also bypass the master bedroom and walk up into a, a, a roof garden. It has a very porous facade on one side and a much tighter facade facing the street. Um, the windows on the side were mainly used for light purposes, not so much for view, although on one side of the house, as I mentioned, had not, nothing next to it. Um, we decided to use the same forms for the windows. For the skylight, we reversed it. Um, so as opposed to a right side up arch, you'll, you'll form a groin vault. Uh, by turning it upside down, basically, we open up the top. Actually, it brings more natural light into the space. Um, and uh, a series of uh, cross sections. This is the, the, the model. Um, here you see the part of the house that had to be raised because of the tsunami. We use a similar uh, vaulting system to raise the house. Um, there's a balcony, and then there's a double height space for the living room. Beyond the living room, you see the kitchen, um, and then the dining room, and then beyond would be the courtyard. Up here would be the master bedroom. 
So the master bedroom looks over the double height space and on the other side looks over the courtyard. Um, here you see some of the early studies of the, uh, of the um, uh, side windows. I'm going to say something about construction very quickly. The construction wise is concrete up to here, concrete slab, and everything above <coughs> is, is built out of steel. Uh, it's a steel frame, and in the pochet areas are cross bracings built out of steel, and then with uh, wood studs infill, which is very uh, typical of Los Angeles construction. Uh, so every, room's are, every room is quite figured. We're hoping that every room has this really its own autonomy, um, that it's defined, but then it's connected. So in this case, that was the, uh, this is the double height living space. This is the master bedroom above. So sometimes we have these, these are what we think are happy accidents. You know, when the one vault just comes very close to another vault that has a very different geometry. And then sometimes these are the unhappy ones where uh, two uh, Gothic arches begins to appear based on the intersection with one uh, barrel vault. Um, and then some of the skylights that we were studying in, in the spaces. Um, so on, on one hand, you have a very porous uh, facade facing the beach. Um, on the other hand, you have a much um, uh, tighter and dense facade facing the street. It actually, it works quite well with the Spanish colonial houses that are nearby. But unlike the Spanish colonial houses, which has a lot of arches, I think this house are more volumetric, so it only has vaults. So there's a bedroom, it's slightly functional. This is smaller, it has, it's taller, but they're always volumetric. We even use the, the volumetric, the, 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 the vault as a way to carve out part of the volume to increase the, the width of the space when the future house is built to make it more generous before you uh, turn and ascend into a, the courtyard. Uh, these are some early studies of the courtyard um, and then walking through the house into um, <coughs> this uh, double height space um, that looks out into the ocean. So this was um, shot right when it was finished. Um, the sand is not uh, brought back in. This will be the future house. This is the path where you walk in and enter into this courtyard. Um, and then looking back from the beach, this is not a person, huh? this is a, a sculpture, unfortunately. A person is about this high. But you see the double height space and the master bedroom and the, the kitchen beyond. Uh, and in contrast to the, uh, the, the street facade with the two garages and the rooms, it's much more open. This is actually built to the edge of the property line, and then the next house will be here. Um, so you walk in, you walk from the, from the edge, and then this is the area where you descend, you turn 90 degrees up into a, uh, um, a courtyard. So when you walk up, you, you look back, you walk up here, you look back, this is the library area. Uh, these are some of the moments where natural light begins to come in. You walk through a corridor before you enter into the guest rooms back here. If you take the same point and you turn, and then you begin to see the... Um, the master bedroom above, the dining, the kitchen, and then you, you walk in from the left and then you eventually walk out into this um, double height uh, uh, living room space, you know. Uh, we try very hard to Photoshop this sculpture out, but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's forget about it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, that, 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 uh, I should say that about the Kai client's uh, eclecticism in collecting, but uh, by fluke, they, they collected these uh, fish lamps that Frank Gehry did uh, at a restaurant, Rebecca's, when it was being torn down. So they savaged it and um, uh, placed it in these two plinths. I thought it was nice to see uh, Frank's earlier 1980s work being in this space. Um, but I, I think for, for me, it's really, for us, it's really about these type of singular rooms. And sometimes we don't see them e even as structure, but slightly defining one space versus the other. Um, and even as the a similar equivalent, so think of a window as a bay window that is uh, attached to the main spaces. Um, um, this is like the, 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 the master bedroom looking through the um, double height space. This is actually looking back from the library. So we are more than two thirds into the house. We look through the courtyard, through all the spaces, but here you begin to see the, the sand and the beach. So it's still 
connected as well as uh, with air. When all the sliding doors are open, the air flows through the house. Um, some of the details of how the intersection of these upside down uh, vaulted skylights um, that comes in from the, from the side uh, in a few occasions, we brought uh, natural light in from the center of the house. In this case, the entry to the two bedrooms um, or the bathroom, um, and then the uh, the back side of the house. So, so I, I think in, in in many ways for us, this is really uh, 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 at the edge of this singularity. This notion of a project that has this singularity on the exterior, but where all these uh, differences of this. Uh, multiple mansions could occur in the interior. Um, other details of natural light that comes in uh, up to the roof and the house. And uh, I'll just end with a few images that the uh, artist, uh, Jack Pearson, came and, and photographed some details of the house in a certain way that, uh, that interest him. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have time for any questions? Yeah. Yeah. As the physician yeah. prescribes. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, maybe to start a round of questions. First of all, I must say, uh, Mark, you such a good introduction to Frank Gehry. Uh, quite amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I noticed in your talk about Gehry at certain points, yeah. many aspects, is that um, material and structure and construction, mm -hmm. even though somehow transgressed, mm -hmm. seems to be very important in Gehry's work. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. At least they also make us very well aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. And even the whitest of his buildings, like yeah. say the one in, uh, in Covitra, yeah. uh, the decision of the roof material versus yeah. the glass. Um, and it's something which I realize now, in a way, your work is completely absent in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, how would you see that? Because, of course, it seems to also coincide with the desire, I would say, for order versus disorder. I mean, these buildings seem to increasingly explode. Yeah. And yes. Despite the fact that I obviously see, and of course, that's it. Uh, it's a bit of a forceful comparison. Yeah. In your work, there seems to be a very big desire to contain. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's, I think that's a, a great observation. I think first is uh, uh, Gary's work. Now, if I look at Gary's work, I think there was one point where uh, when he started looking at the fish lamps, uh, when the fish lamps and the fish scale, it was very experimental with the materiality. At one point, like around the time of Bilbao, the experimentation in form or the implementation of form overtook the materials, like the, the, the degree of uh, experimentation with the lamps and the scales, the snakes and all those were great. And it became more subdued. Yeah? So, so I think in his career, there are different moments of this texture. And, and uh, from a self-reflective standpoint, I, I, I think there are a few things. I think one is, uh, like many uh, bad children, we always try to kill the father. And, and the, I think the generation for us is not really so much Gary, but the disciples of Gary, or the generation of Moss and, and Morpheus, where there's this type of uh, scoperism of every detail, everything is so apparent, you know. And and maybe uh, we also feel that when, that the moment when we start practicing is that LA is not the same LA as it was 30 years ago. And it's not so much a Wild West, you know. It comes across as the Wild West where every, everything is possible. But actually, there are a lot more rules, a lot more restrictions that happen there. And, and this type of rampant, uh, more rampant individualism are not as apparent now as it was then. And we, we feel that the, for the city to grow, it also needs the background buildings to be strong, not just little temples everywhere. And, and I think this, maybe back then when everything was possible, when there's no context, there's the, I think Leon Crea calls it the, um, the uh, classicistness versus the vernaculars. And, and it was all classicistness, like all, whether it's a, a, a garage or LA was all about these individual statements. And, and we feel that at this point, the city also needs to build on its vernacular. And, and maybe that was one of the reasons that uh, that our work begins to, at, at least our first 10, 12 years, were 
had this more less uh, desire to show a certain materiality. Is yeah. it also that your architecture, more than I actually yeah. remembered it, uh, happens in, its, in the interior? And I found it not a surprise that you started mm -hmm. with these two interior pictures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, which okay, you can connect with an observation yeah. that today was the idea of self-expression. Yeah. You just connect yeah, yeah. it yourself. Um, would you would you consider because of course they're very sculptural at first glance, but that sculpturality is more a result of a set of interior transformations. Yeah. I feel a couple of, of uh, I mean, one was um, this famous quote by Ed Ruscha about his, he wants to achieve the response of huh, wow from his audience, like huh, being uh, a certain defamiliarizing as a prelude to uh, cognition and uh, understanding and, and, and uh, uh, excitement, as opposed to wow, huh? You know, I think for me, the generation before was, wow, huh? Like a lot of bells and whistles. But then when you begin to pay attention, you realize there's not much to it. All the energy, architectural energy was spent in getting your, your attention. I mean, I think that was one part of that ethos. <coughs> the second was, um, I think Adolf Loos talked about this gentlemanliness on the exterior facade as a decorum of the city and inside hiding something much more perverse. You know, I, I think we're, there's a certain... Uh, disposition for us to have a certain estrangement on the exterior and then a lot more things that could, uh, in the private realm that happens in the t interior. We, and I, we, it's a certain model of at least Los Angeles democracy that individualism could occur. But maybe the next stage is a certain individualism that respects the larger whole and formation of the city while not taking away this perversiveness. And, and maybe that translates to a certain uh, focus on the interior, and and uh, I, I would say in, a, in our design process, sometimes there's a, a lot of complications that happens in the beginning, but there's a lot of uh, uh, efforts in erasing that complication in the exterior. Uh, I, I think also uh, as a team, I think the the buildings that we are most uh, attracted to tends to be buildings that are have a lot to say, but uh, has a certain reticence. They're not too eager to scream at you, but if you give it the due attention, it, it will tell you a lot. And I think maybe that eventually translates to some of our, our own bar projects to have that type of uh, uh, ambition too. Yeah. I would open uh, the questions to mm -hmm. the public, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to say I'm very happy to say to to, to show this here because not only uh, uh, this context gave me a way to look at Gary again, but always since in the back of our minds, but also uh, Dita. Dita is my friend from uh, we worked together about 20 years, uh, 18, 20 years ago. It was not long after the Vitra building was done, and we had a debate about uh, Vitra. If Vitra has any qualities, I'm glad we get to talk about. We'll talk more tonight, then. Huh? Uh, really, I came in with <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll give you a rerun. <laughs> well, we should yeah. turn cut again. Thank you.